Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm going to try to wrap up the day uh, on a very positive note. Um, the uh, track record that we all share together is amazing. Here are the new drugs that you know about over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, there have been 11 FDA approvals. I think there'll probably be three more maybe this year. Uh, and the survival is arguably three to fourfold uh, extended. Nonetheless, we're, we aren't where we need to be together with our patients. This is the most recent iteration of the NCCN guidelines. First generation bortezomib, Lendex, and pegylated doxorubicin and bortezomib. Second generation pomalidomide and carfilzomib and panabinostat. What I do want to mention just about treating relapse myeloma is shown here. We've all been taught to wait for symptoms, wait for calcium, renal dysfunction, anemia, and bone disease, but why would we do that in the era now when we actually have effective drugs? So I think once we document that there is actually a relapse and there is progression in terms of rising paraprotein, I really don't think it makes a lot of sense any longer to wait for one of these uh, CRAB features to develop now that we have such effective therapies. And obviously, we as caregivers need to think about what the prior history is, what are the comorbidities, age, et cetera, when we choose therapies. We just have more options now. It's really a wonderful day. Well, pomalidomide, I know you, you are very familiar with. I'll go very quickly. It was FDA approved based on a phase two randomized trial showing that POM and low-dose DEX achieved a response in about 30% of patients lasting eight months. This actual response was act in the tr context of all patients. It was in the context, when it was compared with the uh, high-dose dexamethasone, of standard risk and high-risk cytogenetics, including P53 deleted myeloma. So this is a new armamentarium in the far advanced patients. Dr. Jagannath was talking about Greece, so I guess I will too, but Thanos Demopoulos uh, chaired this trial, which in fact confirmed further the POMDEX experience, the so-called Stratus trial. You can see that in this patient, about 80, in this study, 80% of the patients were refractory to both lenalidomide and bortezomib in terms of their myeloma, and roughly 35% of patients uh, responded reproducibly in all the groups, and in fact, the survival was on the order of a year. Now, as you know, we use, all, many of us use, uh, immunomodulatory drug lenalidomide, a proteasome inhibitor, bortezomib, carfilzomib, or maybe exazomib someday as initial therapy. What about for relapse? Can we use the second generation pomalidomide dex in this instance with bortezomib? And this is a Mayo Clinic Dana-Farber collaboration showing that when you add bortezomib to pomalidomide dex, you increase that rate from 35% up to 75 or 80 percent response. So if we can actually afford to do triplet therapies initially and then relapse, it does appear that in fact uh, this combination is useful. You all know that carfilzomib, the epoxy ketone uh, proteasome inhibitor irreversible is also FDA approved in accelerated fashion based on a response rate on the order of 25 percent lasting again eight months and survival uh, in the order of years. This so-called ASPIRE trial you know combined lenalidomide and dexamethasone with carfilzomib versus Lendex and relapse myeloma. I'll just mention real quickly that many of these patients either never had lenalidomide or obviously they, their myeloma could not be refractory. So this is a very early population. Nonetheless, the very impressive results in both standard and high-risk myeloma are here roughly a six-month advantage in terms of progression-free survival, whether the myeloma was standard or high risk. And just to fill out the, uh, what are currently available therapies, if you take pomalidomide dex and not bortezomib this time, but uh, carfilzomib, the same thing happens, roughly an 80% response rate in relapsed myeloma, prolonged progression-free and duration of response. So I think it's a very exciting day. Now, um, which of the proteasome inhibitors are better? I honestly don't know. There was a trial that compared carfilzomib at high doses, 56 milligram per meter squared with bortezomib, that did show a superior progression-free survival. 
and also, importantly, did not show neuropathy. So I think it, the way we think about it is we have available now multiple proteasome inhibitors. I just mentioned very quickly there is a small but nonetheless very real cardiac and pulmonary signal with carfilzomib. So in patients who have cardiac or pulmonary disease, a word of caution. Now, I understand there was quite a debate here this morning about HDAC inhibitors that I missed. But many of you know that we think that they may be important. This cartoon that I like to show has the proteasome being blocked by a whole panoply of proteasome inhibitors, including now a um, exazomib, the oral inhibitor. And it also shows the other pathway, the agrosome pathway, which can be blocked with HDAC inhibitors. And I think that you probably have heard this already, but varinostat to block the agrosome with proteasome inhibitor, bortezomib to block the proteasome, actually was a positive trial. The dual treated patients actually had more responses, but a progression free survival of only about one month because of side effects, including diarrhea, fatigue, and neuropathy. So this didn't even go forward to the FDA. The drug that's actually received FDA approval, one of the approvals this year, was panabinostat, again used to inhibit the agrosomal, proteasome, agrosomal protein degradation together with the proteasome inhibitor bortezomib, and this time there was a four-month progression-free survival. I would point out, though, that fully one-third of the patients had to discontinue therapy, again because of side effects. Well, we've been very privileged to be involved with the uh, production and now testing of a selective HDAC inhibitor. And this slide shows even in the first in man trials that about 45% of patients responded, including one third of patients whose myeloma was refractory to bortezomib. And this agent now can be given each day for 21 days together with IMIDs. It downregulates CMYK IRF4, and as seen in this waterfall plot, we're getting very impressive responses. What will be presented soon at the American Society of Hematology and elsewhere is roughly 50% of patients with bortezomib refractory, lenalidomide refractory, or pomalidomide refractory, when combined with the oral selective HDAC inhibitor, can respond. So we'll see when we have a tolerated HDAC inhibitor what will be the role of this class of drugs in our disease. Now, I really want to talk about some new things. Uh, we are uh, as you know, blessed with immune therapies and some of these others on the list uh, in closing off the day here. Firstly, people, uh, including me, have been looking for monoclonal antibodies for myeloma. I figured it out. It's for over 40 years. Uh, and you would think we would have found one. And we actually now, as a community, have not one but two. Elituzumab, which targets SLAMF7, and Daratumumab and SAR, which targets CD38. Each of them mediate, as shown on this slide, ADCC, CDC, and they do have uh, inhibitory of growth signaling and triggering of death signaling of multiple myeloma cells. Now, the elituzumab story, I won't go over in the interest of time in great detail, but just to remind you, as a single agent in relapsed refractory disease, elituzumab did not achieve any responses. But the theme I want to mention here and emphasize over and over again is combination of immune therapies. If you add lenalidomide to monoclonal antibody in the laboratory, you augment ADCC. If you do it in the clinic, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the PFS is increased. This is hallmark analysis at one and two years, Dr. Laniel's paper, showing that Lendex plus the antibody prolongs progression-free survival compared to the Lendex alone. And this advantage was shared in virtually all of the subgroups of patients, including high-risk myeloma. The immune therapies appear to be able to work even in the context of, for example, 17P deletion. The responses were also improved. Now, the other target is CD38, which uh, I actually noted on myeloma in 1983, but never tested it because CD38 is actually on all kinds of other cells, immune activated cells, endothelial cells, hematopoietic progenitor cells. So frankly, many of us thought it wasn't going to be safe to target. We were wrong, which is uh, not uncommon. 
And so daratumumab and SAR are now utilized. And this paper, a phase one clinical trial was in the New England Journal of Medicine. Very few phase one trials are. The reason is that as a single agent, daratumumab, a humanized anti-CD38 antibody, achieved about one-third response rate. You can see the waterfall plots here. It's very small numbers, but there are complete responses and very good partial responses here. As, and this is a phase two trial uh, confirming uh, that activity. As was true with elituzumab, if you add lenalidomide, you can augment the activity. Now we have response rates in the range of 60, 70, 80 percent, and you can see in the waterfall plot on the right-hand side here at the dose going forward, 16 milligram per kilogram, we're really achieving very significant responses in the majority of patients, again, in high-risk disease. A second CD38 antibody is, in fact, uh, SAR, as shown here, together with Lendex. Again, the same story, 60 percent or more responses. Uh, to this uh, combination. Now, we also have one immunotoxin that's being tested in multiple myeloma against CD138 or Syndican as the target with a metansinoid immunotoxin that's been conjugated. If you in infuse this, you target the cell, the, uh, then the immunotoxin is uh, internalized into the cell and uh, mediates, as you can see here, uh, uh, inhibition of cell cycle uh, progression and death. In this particular early studies, I'll just point out the third bullet point on this slide. In early studies, 83 percent of patients whose myeloma is refractory to bortezomib and lenalidomide are re responding to the CD38 immunotoxin. So whether it be antibody or immunotoxin, I think we are in the era in multiple myeloma. We're catching up to CLL and lymphoma. I think this year we'll have elituzumab, Lendex, and we will have daratumumab highly likely to be approved. Now what about the checkpoint inhibitors? You're going to hear a lot about it in other diseases. What about myeloma? PDL1 is expressed on myeloma. It's also expressed on myeloid-derived suppressor cells and plasma cytoid dendritic cells. Each of those promote myeloma cell growth and suppress the immune system. PD-1 is expressed on T cells, NK cells, and NKT cells. If you therefore block with PD-L1, you are blocking not only the interaction between the tumor cell target and the effector cells, but you're blocking these evil accessory cells, these plasmacytoid dendritic cells and myeloid-derived suppressor cells from carrying out their uh, function as well. So as we're sitting here this afternoon, there are ongoing around the world combination immune therapy trials. We've just mentioned lenalidomide with the monoclonal antibodies. You will hear at the American Society of Hematology, checkpoint inhibitors plus immunomodulatory drugs, very active. Uh, you won't uh, hear from me because of the interest of time, but there are vaccine trials now ongoing with lenalidomide and with checkpoint inhibitors. It turns out if you vaccinate in the presence of both, you get a vast majority of memory cells that are active against myeloma. It's a new world in terms of combination immune therapies. Now, we've recently studied lenalidomide in more detail. We know it stimulates effector cells. We know it targets regulatory T cells and inhibits them, but it's a bit of a checkpoint inhibitor. Lenalidomide downregulates PDL1 on tumor cells, on plasma cytoid dendritic cells, and myeloid derived suppressor cells. Lenalidomide downregulates PD1 on immune effector cells. So it's a bit of a checkpoint inhibitor in and of itself. And if you look at uh, the ability of lenalidomide to enhance the killing of myeloma cells related to uh, checkpoint inhibitors you can see here by CD4, CD8, NK, NKT cells, and myeloid-derived cells. The green bar in each case is lenalidomide plus the checkpoint inhibitor killing autologous myeloma cells. So the data for combination immune therapies gets stronger and stronger. And this is my last slide on this concept. This looks at killing myeloma cells in the presence of PDL1 antibody, PD1 antibody, both of them, lenalidomide, but the tallest and the most killing is in the context of lenalidomide plus the checkpoint inhibitor. 
So this is very exciting, lenalidomide and checkpoint inhibitor or immunomodulatory drug and checkpoint inhibitors are going to augment killing. If you do that in the context of an antibody, you can probably make it more selective. And if you do it in the context of a vaccine, apparently in early studies you can get a memory immune response. I think it's a new world, combination immune therapies. And the final point, you're going to hear, I'm sure, at this meeting about CAR T cells and leukemia and lymphoma and ALL. Well, we in myeloma are trying as well. We don't really know the best target. The targets that have been looked at are listed here. My own favorite, to be honest with you, is BCMA because it's the most selective for myeloma cells and plasma cells. You all know the concept of harvesting T cells, transfecting and activating them against a given target, expanding them ex vivo, and then retransfusing them. One of my patients uh, underwent a CD19 CAR T cell uh, procedure. Uh, a 50-year-old woman who had actually had an autologous transplant, very cytogenetically complicated myeloma. The transplant really didn't last very long at all. And her myeloma progressed in spite of carfilzomib, pomalidomide, varinostat, elituzumab, virtually all treatments. She underwent a CD19 CAR T cell and, uh, infusion, and as shown in the upper right-hand panel here, she has a molecular complete response now lasting over a year. But in my theme of combination immune approaches, she's taking low-dose lenalidomide to have persistence of those immune cells uh, that, are, um, that have had such an amazing effect. Quickly, to finish up with other new drugs, we are uh, very importantly pursuing as a community targeting the ubiquitin proteasome system. You can inhibit the deubiquitilating agents upstream of the proteasome in the hopes of overcoming proteasome inhibitor resistance. With Memorial Sloan Ketting, Dana, Dana Farber has a clinical trial. The agent that's in clinical trial is right here. It causes the massive accumulation of ubiquitinated protein here. Uh, but it doesn't block the proteasome. Here's bortezomib blocking the proteasome. This agent doesn't block the proteasome, but it does cause this massive accumulation of protein. We will see if this concept works. You've already heard from others about exazomib, but I do want to highlight it again here. A new proteasome inhibitor, oral, given once a week, well tolerated. This is going to be very important in multiple myeloma as a single agent without steroids, about a 20% response rate in relapse, and you know if you give it up front with Lendex, it's very, very active. That's what this shows, lenalidomide, Dex, and exazomib, all patients respond, and this time you can actually use exazomib once a week as a maintenance and upgrade the response. I personally have had a patient on exazomib for over five years in a maintenance, and it's been extremely well tolerated. So this is an exciting new opportunity. We had all these debates about uh, maintenance a minute ago, uh, but we never had an opportunity to study it until exazomib came along. There's a final new proteasome inhibitor called merizomib, which is a broad proteasome inhibitor. It's now in clinical development, not by itself, but with the immunomodulatory drug pomalidomide, for the same reasons I showed you earlier, POMDEX, bortezomib, POMDEX, carfilzomib. So here, POMDEX and the new proteasome inhibitor, merizomib. In these preclinical studies, especially on the right-hand side here, low doses of this broad inhibitor with POMDEX can really have a very profound effect. These are other agents that I don't have time to discuss, but I will mention to you that, in fact, I think we have a panoply of new options in multiple myeloma. So to be honest, to think that we are done yet and we don't have new pathways or new biology to explore, I think is very premature. I do want to finish up with a couple of comments about genomics. It's a little bit different than what you usually hear in terms of targeting mutations uh, in single agents or combinations. What you have heard before is when multiple myeloma patients present and you see a new patient sitting in front of you with newly diagnosed disease, not yet treated, they have 55 to 60 mutations right uh, from the start. And in fact, they have at least three to five clones. 
And as the disease progresses, you can, uh, underlying that is genomic evolution. So shown here is a patient who had a single clone at the time of diagnosis who's had that same clone return at the time of relapse. Here is a patient with a single clone, and at the time of relapse, there's a subclone that's developed. Here's a patient with a clone and a subclone, and at the time of relapse, one of the subclones has become more predominant. And here's a patient with a clone and a subclone, and in fact, at the time of relapse, that subclone went away, and there's a new one. The reason that I mention this, and I like to highlight it, is that in multiple myeloma, as in other cancers, if we ever have a hope of using combination agents and really making a major difference, we need to do it up here. I call it the George Washington cherry tree approach to myeloma, but we cannot allow this genomic evolution to occur, at least in my opinion, and think that we're going to have a meaningful impact. Now, the way we have been using genomics is a little bit different than what you might be accustomed to. We're using genomics to try to tell us about biology. What are the pathways we want to target? And I want to just finish with two quick examples. Here's one where, in fact, our genomic analysis showed that there was decreased copy number here in leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma of something called YAP1 or YAP1. And to make a long story short for you, there weren't any mutations, so we're not talking about targeting a mutated uh, 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 gene product. What I will tell you is that in multiple myeloma, there is large, already constitutive, ongoing DNA damage. Tremendous genomic instability, untreated constitutive. And because of that, there's a DNA damage response, but these myeloma cells don't die. And why don't they die? They don't die because the pathway here, but which triggers their death through P73, includes YAP1. And if YAP1 is not expressed, they live in spite of all this DNA damage. So how are we going to put YAP1 back into tumor cells inside of a patient? Well, one of our postdoctoral fellows, Francesca Cottini, showed that there was a kinase that was suppressing this YAP1 expression, and when she genetically deleted it, she could do what's shown on this slide. She could move from the left to the right-hand side by inhibiting this kinase and trigger a natural death process, P73-mediated apoptosis, even in the context of 17P-deleted, P53 non-functioning myeloma. So as we're sitting here, we have with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society uh, produced now some very promising STK4 kinase inhibitors for the purpose of restoring a natural death process. So the second and the final example I want to tell you is this. You all know that C-MYC is amplified in myeloma and many of the lymphomas. And what it does in myeloma, it confers a really quite abysmal prognosis. When our laboratory studies, C-MYC is amplified in multiple myeloma and results in a couple of outcomes. Very high levels of replicative stress on the one hand and very high levels of reactive oxygen species on the other. And this is now biology that's being informed by this overexpression of C-MYC. In this case, what we're going to do is inhibit the replicative stress response. There are now drugs to do that. And we're going to use drugs to increase the oxidative stress. In other words, make it impossible for the myeloma cell to deal with this endogenous high level of replicative stress and increase the ROS and, as a consequence, massively increase apoptosis, i.e., it's, again, it's amplification of a gene, but it's informing biology, in this case, not only single agent treatment, but combination treatment. So what I've tried to show you is that we now are blessed in multiple myeloma. We have a number of agents already here that are listed for relapse. But in my opinion, and I keep saying this every year, I think the best is yet to come. My Lord, the, the Mets are going to be in the World Series. Uh, in any event, right? I can say that I'm going to root for them. The Red Sox have been done for months. So uh, anyway, the best is here. The best is yet to come because of the novel agents I shared with you. We have, well, we have antibodies for the first time. We have oral proteasome inhibitors. We have HDAC inhibitors. I think the most promising strategies I tried to emphasize for you 
is combination immune approaches, because early days anyway, but it looks like you can get a selective and maybe a memory immune response in patients against their own myeloma. Combinations, as we learned many years ago with conventional therapy, We've learned it with targeted therapy. Now we're going to relearn it with immune therapies. But I honestly believe the best is yet to come. And it's going to be a real pleasure to do some of these protocols together with our patients and continue to transform the natural history of this disease. Thanks ever so much.